the Health and Life Coach, a former Wellbema ambassador, and one of your wellness class educators. And my email is abby.horton at ua.edu. If you would love to reach out and connect, or if you have a question or something comes up that you wanted to reach out about, please feel free. I'm happy uh, to field those questions and to help to connect you to resources if that's something that you're interested in. So definitely save my email if you would like to reach out. So our class goals today, we're going to talk about the importance and the impact of gratitude. We're going to talk about how to really develop an attitude of gratitude and explore that more. We're going to learn specific strategies to develop and support a gratitude practice because it does take practice to think about gratitude in this way. And then we're going to provide a practical framework for how to practice and include gratitude on a daily basis. So it is November 1st, which I agree with Miranda, that just feels like the year has blown by, especially this semester. Uh, and it's funny because gratitude is so associated with November, but I am here to tell you, and you probably already know this, but gratitude is not just something we should do at November. It's not something that should just be about Thanksgiving, um, but really gratitude, we want it to be a part of your daily life. And so we're going to talk about gratitude from that frame of reference. We love that gratitude gets spotlighted and, um, you know, really highlighted during this season. But gratitude is something that we don't want to just relegate to one month or one time of the year. We really want you to embrace it every day as a part of the way that you live your life. So World Gratitude Day is actually on September 21st. So I think that's really fun because one of the things I'm going to suggest to you is that um, you know, when we do have certain times to celebrate gratitude, like the September 21st World Gratitude Day or during the month of November, um, those are really important. Maybe you want to think about doing something extra special around gratitude to make it really fun, to make it feel more celebratory uh, while you're actually developing that daily practice of incorporating it into just your routine, your lifestyle. So gratitude, I think it's always important to define these concepts. So who has it? Anyone can have gratitude, right? What is it? Gratitude is the quality of being thankful and grateful. It's a readiness to show appreciation for and to return kindness to someone. When does it happen? Think about when you feel most grateful. And I think that it will be different for all of us. But when do you feel most grateful? Um, if you all have something, you can jot that down. Think about that for a minute and think, when when do I feel grateful? When's the last time I feel um, that feeling of gratefulness? And that might be really telling and important to you in terms of how you want to cultivate gratitude in the future. Where does it happen? So when do you feel most grateful? Is it at work? Is it at home? Is it with friends? Um, is it with family? When When do you feel most grateful? Where does it happen? Why do you think it happens? So think about when you feel that feeling of gratefulness, was there something that happened right before you felt that feeling? Usually gratitude is is spontaneous in a way, but it also is usually because of something that happened that triggered that feeling that probably is very similar to something you've had an experience before. There's probably a pattern to it, right? I think all of us will feel gratitude in different ways at different times, but usually there's a, a personal pattern that we can note if we take time to self-reflect and create that good self-awareness around gratitude. And then when you feel grateful, I think this is one of the most important questions. How do you express it? So I think a lot of times, and I know for me, I'm guilty of this, um, you know, thinking about something that makes me feel grateful, that makes me feel really appreciative, and then not sharing that. Either, you know, not acknowledging it to myself in the moment, and maybe not also not expressing it and, and sharing it with the person that maybe inspired the feeling. So an example for me this morning, and this doesn't happen very often, but I like to share examples from my own life because I think that really helps connect the content. Um, but this morning, my husband uh, noticed that our towels didn't feel completely dry, and I think they were probably just cold. But he turned the dryer back on for me this morning um, before I was getting up and getting ready for my day so that I had a warm towel to start the day. 
that's not something that happens very often at all. And so kind of the novelty of it was really nice because usually I'm up first and start my day first. And so um, I thought that was really, really kind. And then yesterday, someone bought a drink for me at Starbucks and delivered it to me. And I thought that that was really kind. And so sometimes it's about a gift. Sometimes it's about a kind act. Um, a lot of times there's a surprise or a novelty that comes with it. It's not expected. Um, so think about when you'll have those moments, you know, do you express it in the moment? Um, for me this morning, I was a little sleepy. I'm not, you know, a morning person typically. And and so it takes me a little bit of time to kind of wake up and get rid of that groggy feeling. And um, so I have, you know, I thought, oh, I'm really grateful for that. But in the moment, I didn't say that. So before he left for the day, I probably didn't really thank him the way I wanted to. So I called him on my way to work and said, oh, by the way, thanks for doing that. That was really nice of you. Um, and so it's just kind of a moment of it's always great to express your gratitude in the moment as soon as you can. Um, but there's never a rule about, oh, well, don't call and then thank them later because, you know, all of that really matters. And that appreciation, um, those acts of kindness, even to your spouse, even to your partner, even to someone who's kind of, you know, in a committed relationship with you. Um, you know, we don't want to miss those opportunities. The Gottman Institute uh, is all about love and marriage and relationships. And I think all of the work that they do actually applies to even platonic relationships. And they talk about bids for attention, and it's when you try to connect with someone else. And uh, there's a lot around connectivity, relationships that really resonate with this feeling of gratitude. So we'll talk more about that. But it's always good to share the feeling of gratitude with others. So if someone does something and you're like, oh, that was really nice, make sure that they know that you appreciate it and that you acknowledged it. So gratitude's impact. Gratitude helps to heal, to energize, and to change lives. So Dr. Robert Emmons, he is the world's scientific leading expert on the kind of research body around gratitude. And he says that gratitude not only makes you feel good, it can have dramatic and lasting effects on your well-being. Research indicates that gratitude can lower blood pressure, improve immune function, reduce cardiac inflammation, increase happiness, improve relationships, and decrease depression. And so I've linked to one of the articles that he helped to write around why is gratitude good. But if you Google his name, you will see so many TED Talks and YouTube videos and articles and his own website that you can go and explore. And goodness, it would take you all month, I think, to get through even the bulk of what he's put together because he's been studying this for at least 12 plus years to my knowledge, and I'm sure probably even longer than that. And he talks about putting on your grateful glasses. And so, or putting on your gratitude glasses is another way that you could reframe that. And I think that's so important because a lot of times we talk about wearing rose colored glasses and we say, oh, well, you know, life is great and I'm just going to kind of ignore that there's something going on in my life or in the world. And I think gratitude glasses are different than rose colored glasses because gratitude lets you see clearly through a clear lens of how life really is. But it's you making a conscious decision to choose to be grateful anyway versus rose colored glasses, which um, really kind of have this positive toxicity or you might even hear them say toxic positivity um, where you are just saying, you know, I know that, you know, everything in life is not good, but I'm just going to choose to ignore that and I'm just going to only see the positive. Um, and so in the last few years, we've talked about toxic positivity as being this kind of sugar coating of life. And I don't think that when you look at the world today, when you, you know, have lived through the COVID-19 pandemic, when you see a lot of the things that are going on in the world in terms of, um, you know, the geopolitics, the, the social conflicts, the social justice issues, you know, we could list so many things that don't feel like they're going right, that don't feel like, um, you know, that, that don't feel like they inspire gratitude. And we can get so bogged down in that. We can even look at our own lives and think about things that are really, really challenging and feeling like it's so hard to be grateful in the moment. And sometimes people even think that it's, you know, quote unquote, wrong to feel grateful. Um, but, but the thing that I would say is that the people who are going through hard times need you to feel grateful. They actually probably want you to feel grateful for all of the good in your life because 
then it makes the hard that they're going through, it, it really can almost be validating. So if you know anything about me, um, I have had a lot of different challenges over um, over my life as a child growing up with chronic illness and as an adult, um, going through a lot of hard things. And um, several years ago, while I was going through especially char- you know, challenging hard time in my life, I had a friend reach out via Facebook Messenger and say, I see you posting a lot of really happy, inspiring things, but I also appreciate that you're sharing kind of the hard things in your life. And I just don't understand how you can show such gratitude in the face of all of the challenges that you're having. And when she emailed me that or or messaged me that, I thought, you know, I don't I don't know either. I don't know that I really thought about it in that way, but I thought it was a really good thing to to address with with her. And then for me to even think about myself is how how do I do that? That's just kind of my natural bent in life. That's just kind of how I've always responded. And so it wasn't something that I had to really choose. It's just how I had always looked at life. And so it made me start to really self-reflect and think, you know, why do I choose to focus on the good even when there's some really hard things going on? And so I responded to her because she said, you know, my life is really good and I feel, you know, gratitude, but I feel guilty for feeling gratitude. And I said, no, no, the people who are going through hard times, we want you to feel gratitude because we see how great your life is and we're happy for you and we want that for ourselves. And we want to know that you appreciate and, and are grateful for the wonderful things in your life because we would love to have those moments. Um, and anyway, it started a really great conversation, but it opened my eyes to people who, um, you know, even though they may have a lot of good going on, they, there may be some guilt around enjoying that. And so I would say absolutely embrace gratitude, regardless of what's currently going on in your life, because Life is a lot of hills and valleys. You know, you're going to be on the top of the mountain some days and you're going to be at the bottom of the valley other days. And some years are going to be valleys and some years are going to be hills. And a lot of times it's going to be both. It's it's not and or, but it, it's it's that it's both at the same time. And so practice gratitude every day. Um, think about things differently. So I always try to look at things now after having gone through a lot of you know health challenges and just different challenges in my life of what is this trying to teach me? Especially if there's a pattern of something that keeps happening over and over in my life. I always go back to like, what is there? Obviously, there's a lesson I haven't learned yet. What is this trying to teach me? And that helps me be grateful in the moment. Um, for me, you know, I have had um, a recent tumor removed and had a, a difficult recovery and surgery in the spring. And that was a challenge that I would not want to go through again. But right now I'm seeing how that changed my heart and my mindset around other people who are going through similar things. And I have a friend who is going through a recovery journey from surgery, and I'm able to support that friend in a way that I could have supported them had I not experienced my complications with my surgery. And so I had a moment of gratitude. It was a very painful, very challenging experience, but I was able to be there for someone else and to help them and to give them some, you know, hope and some reassurance that I wouldn't have had had I not walked through that experience. And so it's all about using the pain that you have to to create meaning and um, to develop a gratitude for the things that come our way, because we all want to be happy. We all want to be grateful. But it's the challenges sometimes that make us feel like we don't have the ability to be grateful. So that's why I'm talking about kind of the life challenges that we all experience. So gratitude also helps to improve our feelings of well-being, our happiness, and our overall health. Like I mentioned, uh, really, when you look at the impact of gratitude, there isn't anything that it doesn't help. <laughs> gratitude is almost like the magic pill, the cure-all, the band-aid for everything that we could have going on. Um, someone even likened it when I was looking at some resources to update this slideshow. They said, you know, if this if gratitude were a pill or a prescription that you could take, we couldn't afford it because it just cures everything. And I think that that's a bold claim, but I don't know that it's wrong. And I think we have a lot of good research that supports that gratitude does really impact everything about our mental, our physical health, and then just our overall well-being in general. So it makes relationships and connections stronger, enhances our confidence, adjusts our mindset, highlights our strengths heals ourselves, 
um, cultivates our resilience, helps keep us present in the moment. Y'all know uh, if y'all have attended a class before, I always say you need to be present where your feet are. Your feet aren't in yesterday. Your feet aren't in an hour ago. They're not in tomorrow, but they're right here. So be present where you are. Increases our patience, makes us happier, elevates our mood, increases our energy. And I was going to keep adding as many things as I could find. And I just I, I ran out of room and space to be able to do that because it just helps with so many different facets of our life. And I think that's great to acknowledge. Um, it's just a vast, very complex concept, this notion of gratitude. So gratitude is a skill. And developing gratitude is a skill, it's a practice, it's something that benefits everyone if you actually engage in it, and it's particularly helpful during challenging times. And again, according to Dr. Amens, he talks about gratitude gives us the strength of character to make life better, not only for ourselves, but also for others. And so I want you to keep that in mind as you think about where you want to feel grateful. Um, how do you want to feel grateful? Who do you want to express that gratitude to? Gratitude is also a process. So this first step is to actually let yourself feel grateful. And sometimes it is a choice. You have to decide, I'm going to choose to feel grateful in this moment. Um, sometimes gratitude pops up and it's more spontaneous, which is always a good thing. And you have to just let yourself feel grateful, right? You have to not feel guilty or shameful about enjoying the good in your life. And um, you have to allow yourself to recognize those positive aspects of your life and feel that emotion and really, you know, acknowledge that gratitude is a, almost a mindset. Uh, it's a decision that you have to engage every day. Um, so gratitude is not something that you're going to feel every moment of your life, every day of your life, but you can choose to feel grateful. So another step is step two is express that gratitude. So thank others, show appreciation, demonstrate that generosity of spirit that comes up to us, that kind of bubbles to the surface sometimes. The more that we feel grateful, the more that we express gratitude, the easier it's going to be to actually be in this attitude of gratitude. Um, and it will become more um, kind of second nature to you. You won't have to think about, oh, I need to feel grateful today. Let me write three things down. That can be a good practice to get started, but it's not going to be something that you always have to consciously choose. Sometimes it's just going to bubble up to the surface. And those are the, the really fun moments. Gratitude is a practice, and, and it, on this next slide, I'm going to tell you, gratitude requires that you practice it. Um, so one thing that you can do is you can do a challenge where on November 1st, so y'all can start today, I love the fresh energy of a new month, of a new week. Um, but I teach a habit change class, and I always tell you, like, the best time to start is now. Even if it were November 30th, the best time is always to start now. It's not to say, oh, well, it's November 30th, so I'll wait until next November. No, always start today. Always start now. Um, make the next best decision that you can. And um, you don't have to wait for a new year, a new week, a new month to really begin a, a new practice, a new habit. And so that mindset alone will change your life. <laughs> so 30 days of gratitude, um, you know, maybe think about a person that you're glad to have in your life. But even more than that, that second step would be to reach out to that person, to send them a text message and say, hey, I was just thinking about how grateful I am for you. And then give them something really specific. So tell them, you know, I am so grateful that you made time to send me a, a, a note in the mail when I was going through a really hard time. That was super nice of you to do that. And I just want you to know how much I appreciate you. Um, maybe it's something that is uh, a favorite memory. If that memory is something that you can relive, or if there's someone that shared that memory with you, maybe you send a picture or send something that captures that memory and say, hey, do you remember when we did this? How fun was that? We should do that again. Let's try that again. So those are some things that you can do. So write it down, take a picture, do something tangible with the things that you're noting on these days of gratitude. And then if you can take it a step further, actually involve other people. Um, so maybe it's a book that you loved um, reading. Well, you know, you could just think, okay, I'm going to put in my journal, which I think is a great practice. You know, I loved reading XYZ book. 
Well, maybe instead of just writing it down, maybe then you go and say, hey, here's the link to this book I really enjoyed. Um, I'm going to just text my friend and say, I think you might enjoy reading this and here's why. I sent you the link or I sent you a, you know, a snapshot of what the, the book looks like. That's another good way um, for you to kind of extend and express that gratitude. And then gratitude does take practice. So it's like any skill that you learn, it takes you doing it over and over and over again. It's that repetition that actually makes it solidify, that makes that brain kind of wire and fire together. Um, and that becomes a part of your daily practice. So you need to practice gratitude until it just becomes something that you automatically do. It takes a while. For some of us, it's going to take months. For some of us, it's going to take years. Um, but it doesn't mean that just because we don't see instant gratification that it's not working. <laughs> because anytime you uh, make a healthy choice, anytime you decide to be grateful in the moment when you don't really feel like being, that's always going to impact your health and your well-being and your happiness. And so even if you don't do it perfectly, that's completely fine. We're humans. We're not going to be perfect. But the more that we practice, the better we're going to get, the better effects we're going to have. So journaling is helpful. We always think about a gratitude practice as being journaling, writing down three to five things every day that we're grateful for. That is the number one thing that you hear about in terms of gratitude in November. If it's not a social media challenge that tells you to do 30 days of, of a challenge like I shared on the other slide, those are the two most popular. Um, but I think it's so important that you do that and then and you make that a practice and then you build from that. So that's a foundational habit. You could thank someone or show appreciation, like I mentioned, write and mail a thank you note. Look for the good. Notice the helpers. Uh, you know, there's a really popular quote by Mr. Rogers about when he um, was a child that his mother would always tell him during difficult times to notice the helpers and look for the helpers. And I can't think of anyone that um, I associate with kindness and compassion and gratitude more than Mr. Rogers, probably because he was the first person I really saw kind of role model that in that way for me. And so um, I think that's just a really a poignant quote. And I think we always need to notice the helpers and look for the good when we're having challenging times. Repeating gratitude affirmations, I'll share one at the end of the slideshow. That's also a great practice. Um, you know, you can even say something as simple as I choose gratitude today or I choose to feel grateful in this moment. That's a gratitude affirmation. And you may just say that every day. When I was going through my recovery in the um, spring semester, I uh, was having an issue with my wound um, opening back up. And so week three, after having my tumor removed and my adrenal gland removed and my liver resected, my like six or so inch incision opened up. And I had had that happen before in a previous surgery, which it was a really, really horrific surgery um, and took four months to heal. And, and it had a lot of like wound packing and things. It was just a very emotional and painful experience for me, physically painful experience. And so all of those emotions came back up for me, even though the healing process was not nearly that long or that difficult this time, it brought those emotions up to me. So I had to remind myself every day to feel grateful that I had time to take off for work, that I could be on FMLA, that I was still able to get paid because I had enough days, um, that friends were checking on me. Those were the things that I did for my gratitude practice. I did not send thank you notes. I did not write down in my journal. I didn't have the energy or the capacity to do that, but I would make sure that I would say out loud, I'm really grateful. And then after I healed and recovered, I did send the text messages and I did send the thank you notes. But one of the affirmations that I said every morning is, I'm getting better every day in every way. And I would repeat that five times. And five is not a magical number, but it was just the number I landed on. <laughs> it was the number that my mom would make me repeat things when I was studying as a kid because she had read some tip that that helped. And so five has always been my, my lucky number, my special number. And so I would say it, I'm getting better every day in every way. And some days I said that while I was crying in the shower. But I said it every day because it did help me and it did help remind me that eventually I would get past this. <laughs> eventually there would be healing and I would go back to work and life would resume some normalcy. But I needed that affirmation. Um, and I would say things like, I'm going to be grateful for this. What is this teaching me, Abby? And that helped. 
Um, doing random acts of kindness, we don't always have the capacity for that, but I think when we can, we should. Um, and then creating a gratitude jar. So this is a really popular one that people will do sometimes in November, but a lot of times I see them doing it in January where you drop in a little note. It could be a scrap of paper or it can it could be something that you make to be really pretty and cute, but just putting in something that you're grateful for every day or every week. So at the end of the year, you take your gratitude jar and you go back through the jar and you read everything that you were grateful for that year. I think that that's a really, really special and fun way to do it as well. I think it's important that we lead with gratitude. You know, for me, every person is a leader. In nursing, we have this mantra, every nurse a leader. And I would say every human a leader because in some role, in some way, we're leading. Uh, it might be that we're leading, you know, our favorite pet at home. Maybe you have a dog that you love. You're their leader. <laughs> um, it may be that you're a leader in your work role. It may be that you're a leader because you're a parent or a leader because you are a spouse or partner. Um, in some way, I think we're all leaders and we all have the capacity to lead. And so knowing your metric of success, I think, is so important because when we have expectations of ourselves and others, if they're not realistic, then a lot of times we will get so consumed with the shoulds and coulds. Um, and y'all hear my language. I say should a lot. <laughs> I, I'm working on that, but it, it's a slow process to change that language. Um, but when you say should a lot, you probably have a lot of expectations about life and things in general and of yourselves. And so knowing what your metric of success is is so important because there's always going to be an external metric of success. And we have to meet that to some degree because we've got to be you know, good citizens and functional humans. But your success metric may look different and I think that's probably a good thing at the end of the day you have to have a good metric um a funny story for me when I was a mom of one child my oldest daughter is about to turn 16 this Saturday so I'm doing a lot of reflective you know thought around that you know that's a bittersweet time if you have gone through some of those milestones with kids in your life um, and for me, my metric of success as a parent, as a mom, when she was a baby, was very different than when I became a mom of three and had my first set of twins. Um, and then when I had a second set of twins, my metric of success is no one's crying, no one's bleeding, everyone's alive and well. It's been a success. Everyone's fed. <laughs> it's been a successful day. So my metric of success was very different from child one to child five. Um, and I think that was good because I needed to learn to adjust my expectations and my kids have definitely taught me that. Um, you know, so look for those moments. Um, Dr. Edie Wadsworth is a physician out of uh, Tennessee and she talks a lot about in her health coaching practice. She talks about, you know, treasure hunting in your past. So going back and looking at that hard things and looking for those little treasures, you know, yes, it was hard, but where are those treasures? Where are the things that I learned? Those, what I would call those golden nuggets, the things that I learned, the lessons that I learned, the friendships that I made, um, you know, the connections that I had, you know, what what is the real treasure in those hard times? And I think that's really helpful. Lead by example and be genuine when expressing gratitude. Um, you know, sometimes it's difficult to find things to be grateful for. Sometimes it's difficult to find things to share with other people that you're grateful for. Um, so when you have a, a team or when you have a family member, we're coming up on the holidays for a lot of this. Um, you know, sometimes we have difficult relationships with people that we love, with people that we work with. And so... I think it's a really important concept to find something about them that you feel grateful for. Um, so when you do have a conflict with their personality or, um, you know, you do have a miscommunication and you have that difficult relationship or that difficult conversation kind of going on, you know, you can really change that by having a, an attitude of gratitude and think, what is this teaching me and how can I show up where I'm really proud of myself? Um, so instead of, you know, broaching that relationship or that conversation with, OK, I'm right, you're wrong. And here's why I need to prove that to you. 
and look from their perspective and see how they might be viewing something differently from you. Um, look at the perspective of someone who loves them. You know, they have a, a parent, a spouse, a partner, a child, a, a neighbor, a best friend who loves them. What does that person love about them? And when you can look at it from that perspective, I think that really helps relationships. Um, get to know people. You know, I tell people all the time, it's really hard to get to know someone that, or, or to dislike someone that you get to know. Uh, and I think that's true. You know, sometimes you can have a lot of, you know, challenging relationships at home, at work, just in life in general. But when you get to know that person and understand, you know, more about them, understand their history, their background, it is really, really hard to dislike them. And so always get to know them. And and that starts with you extending that invitation, um, you know, extending that olive branch of like, maybe you just talk with them. Maybe you go by and say hello. You don't ask them for anything. You don't refer to the email you sent them. Um, you don't, you know, ask them about, you know, whatever, you know, project or whatever source of conflict. You just say, hey, I was just passing by. I wanted to say hello. Hope you're having a good day. And let them respond to you. And, and it may not be the response that you're expecting. And if they don't respond in kind, then just say, okay, well, I see you're busy, but just wanted to say hello. Hopefully we can chat sometime soon or something like that. Something that feels authentic to you. And do that consistently. The more consistently you do that, the more they're going to really open up to you and be receptive to that. Um, particularly if you've had some instances in the past where you've had conversations that haven't gone so well. Be a servant leader, offer your help and support. Um, again, you just want to give freely. You know, you don't want to give with expectation. So um, when you go to do something in life, if you can give from your heart and give freely and just say, you know, I want to give this gift. I want to do this thing. I want to express this appreciation. When you do that with no expectation of them saying thank you, with no expectation of them doing anything for you in return, that is truly serving, giving, offering yourself to someone um, in a really authentic way. And we don't always have the capacity for that. So I'm not telling you you need to do this. This is not a prescription, but it's just something to consider because maybe you do have the capacity and you might not today, but hopefully you will tomorrow or you will in the future. So acknowledge your individual strengths, what you feed grows. There's a, you know, an old adage about the wolf that you feed. Y'all probably know that one. It's a popular one that people talk about in higher ed and leadership. So I'm sure y'all probably heard about, you know, is it the good wolf or the bad wolf? And, um, you know, and I don't like to say good or bad because it's all relative, but, but that's how the adage goes. And they, you know, kind of ask, you know, which wolf is bigger, which one, um, you know, do you listen to more? And then, you know, that kind of outside external voice is saying the one that you feed it is the one that grows. And it's true. Um, so try to accept others as they are. Accept yourself as you are. You know, a lot of times the things that we don't like about others are things that are mirroring something in us that we don't like. And that's not a fun thing to say. <laughs> you know, that's not a fun thing to to think about yourself. But when we're critical of other people, notice what you criticize most often, because it's probably something that you also criticize yourself for or that you have been criticized for. Um, notice if the voice that criticizes you internally, that inner critic, some of us have an inner critic more than others, but is that inner critic actually your voice or is it someone else? Um, and, you know, and if I were going to be really, um, you know, candid and we were having a one to one conversation, I would tell you that the inner critic that I hear is my voice today. But the inner critic was really me internalizing criticism that I received throughout my childhood and throughout my early adult years. And so it's it's Abby saying it today, but it originated with other people in my life. And so I have to acknowledge that. Um, you know, do I silence that inner critic? And if I do, how do I do that? Uh, and usually it's by naming it. And so uh, my good friend and I named my inner critic. And so I will call her by name and I'll say, OK, you're being really mean today. You need to stop talking to me like that. Um, and it's a fun, super, super silly way to just kind of get my attention back on track and say, OK, we're not going to be mean today. We're not going to be mean to ourselves, because a lot of times the things that we say to our ourselves or and things that we criticize about ourselves are hopefully and usually not the things that we would say to other people or not the things that we would say to our best friend. 
So be sincere, authentic, and positive. Engage, encourage, and reward the people that are around you and reward yourself. Provide individualized and frequent feedback in, to people in your life. And so we call it the sandwich method. I break this down a little bit later, but it's one good thing. It's the thing that you needed to really convey that's probably not so good feeling. And then another good thing. So, hey, thank you for turning that project in on time. I noticed that there were some editorial, you know, issues with it that we probably need to go back in and look at again. Can you do X, Y, and Z? Um, but I love your attention to detail in how you blah, 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 blah. That was a really great catch for you to um, include that. That's how you do the sandwich method. It makes a world of difference. You can feel good about giving that, you know, feedback, but also that person can feel good too. Um, you know, we talk about constructive criticism. I don't like that term uh, or constructive feedback, which I prefer. Uh, but I would just prefer to just call it feedback. <laughs> you know, give your feedback the way you would want to receive it build a culture of gratitude. You know, we all have a role to play. I'm not suggesting that we can always change a culture, but I think that we can change our little corner of the world. I was having a wonderful conversation with a colleague here on campus, and um, she asked me, she's a very thoughtful person, she asked me, she's like, what drives you and motivates you every day? And I say, well, it's what I tell my students. I can't change the world, but I can change my little corner of it. And so in my world, I can do these things that make a difference. And I can teach my students to do those things. And it has that ripple effect. You know, it's the butterfly effect of what happens around the world can then influence the other side of the world. And so I said, you know, by doing that and by causing that ripple effect, it gives my life meaning and purpose. And the things that I've walked through that are challenging to me now serve a greater purpose. Uh, and that's fulfilling to me. That is not going to be the motivator for every person um, on this call. You will have something very, very different for me probably. But I think it's important for you to get to know yourself. A lot of times we think that we know ourselves really well until we are facing a crisis or a challenge or we're asked to explain something, you know, to provide a justification for something. And then we're like, well, why do I believe that? Well, why do I do that? I don't know. And so I think it's important that through journaling, through self-reflection, we can find those things out about ourselves. Um, be unoffendable. And so, I, again, I work with students every day. Students are my life. I love being able to teach them and to walk alongside them as they become nurses. Um, I really do feel like it's something that I was meant to do. And so I tell them all the time, you know, I'm going to be unoffendable because I need your feedback. And I want you to try to be unoffendable because you're going to be working in a dynamic healthcare environment that can be stressful. And you're going to have patients that, you know, interface with you, you know, physicians, other healthcare providers, and they're not always going to be at their best. Our patients certainly are not going to be at their best because they are in the hospital usually and need our care. So if you can be unoffendable and not take things personally, then that's going to really help your overall sense of health and well-being. It doesn't mean that we don't set good boundaries. It doesn't mean that we don't give feedback and say, I'm going to come back when you can talk to me in a, in a different tone of voice, or I'm going to come back to you when you've had a moment to collect yourself. It's not saying that we're not going to have healthy boundaries to set those boundaries and force them. Not at all. But it does mean that I'm not going to internalize the things that they say to me. Um, so I had someone <laughs> yell at me recently um, because they were upset about something not going well. And um, and I just stood there and smiled. And then the person immediately said, oh, my goodness, I'm so sorry. Why did I yell at you? Like you just walked up and asked if you could help me. And I walked up and asked if I could help because I saw that they were stressed. And when I did that, it was the thing that made that person, um, you know, feel triggered and they snapped because they don't like to ask for help. And so when someone notices that they need help, that's something that's difficult for them. And why do I know that that was true? Because I have had moments like that where I want to be able to do things and not ask for help either. Um, and that it bothers me when people notice that I need help because I try to be robotic and inhuman. And that's not possible. Um, so I just smiled and then accepted the apology. I was like, it's OK. I understand. I knew you needed help. That's why I came. And I was like, I, I will need help tomorrow. That is, that is what we're here for. We're a team. And I think using that language that we're a team is so important. We say family a lot, especially in the work environment. Oh, we're a part of this family or, um, you know, we talk about, you know, the work culture. And I'd really like us to start to thinking of our work 
um, as a community or as a team, because I think that that helps set healthy boundaries as well. Um, you know, a work family, I think that that has really good intentions, but to talk about a work community, to talk about a work team, I think um, is, is just a better way to reframe that because we are a team, we are a community. Uh, and that helps set those healthy boundaries around work and life and helps us to feel more grateful because it adjusts our expectations and our mindset. Unity comes from accountability to one another, and that's going to look different depending on the relationships and the roles that you have. But you really have to be accountable. You have to be able to say hard things. You have to be able um, to talk about um, difficult situations with one another and build that trust and relationship. And for the first part of my life, because I hadn't really been role modeled in how to approach things, um, and nursing is a very different type of environment from teaching, um, you know, I didn't see the value because I'm a worker bee. I like to work. I love people, but I kind of, you know, categorize my, my life. You know, I put things in little nice boxes and I'm like, okay, this is work. This is this. This is this. And that helped a lot with productivity, but it doesn't help when you need to build relationships. And so I would encourage you that if you're someone who's very type A, very productive, very much task oriented, think about when one moment of the day, go and try to do something that's more about relationship building because success and productivity can only take you so far if you don't have the connections and relationships to build upon. So if you're someone who sits and types away at their desk all day and doesn't get out and doesn't do, you know, lunch in the community lunch room or, you know, or break room and, and doesn't do a lot of those kind of social interactions, I would encourage you to put one thing on your calendar a day. And it can be as simple as going say, saying hello to that coworker that you never really speak to. It could be going to um, check your mailbox and intentionally speaking to someone who's at the copier. It doesn't have to be anything big or grand, but do something every day to get out of your workspace and to go connect with someone and to really ask about their day, their life, you know. I think a lot of times we say, oh, how was your weekend? Great. How was yours? Oh, good. Busy. And then we move on, right? Well, that's not a real authentic connection. Um, it's just kind of what we do. It's just social conversation. But when we say, oh, hey, how is your um, daughter? I know she's turning, you know, 16 this week. Like, how's the party planning going? Are y'all excited or nervous about her driving test? You know, like asking about real details, that forms those lasting connections. And so I would encourage that. I did not always do that at the best, um, you know, early on in my career um, and in my life because I felt like I just needed to be so driven that everything felt so important that I had to do my to-do list and prioritize that over other things. And I've learned that really, truly, it's all about gratitude. It's all about people. It's all about relationships. The, the tasks, the to-dos that I've accomplished didn't mean anything when I was going into surgery for this team or not knowing what the outcome was going to be. Those tasks and to-dos were not as important. The awards, the accolades, that was not what was on my mind. And so um, I'm grateful for the teamer because it really did teach me a lot about life and about myself. And um, it, it lets you live life in a different way. So I'm very grateful for that. Consistency and transparency are key. Laugh, be silly, be serious. Um, silly and serious can coexist, and it took me a really, really long time to learn that. You know, you can't be serious all the time, but I really tried to be serious for my entire life. <laughs> but being happy, being, you know, silly, laughing, all of those things, smiling, it's just as important as being serious and productive. Um, don't make gratitude a chore. Y'all, if you don't feel like writing three things down today because you're just like, I, I just can't, think of one thing. Don't write it down. Just just think at the end of this call, I'm going to find something to be grateful for. And then tomorrow, maybe you write it down. And the next day, maybe you write two things down. And the next day, maybe you write three things down. And the next day, maybe you write three things down and you text somebody. You actually express that gratitude. Um, when you make it a chore of like, okay, well, I've got my three things done. Um, then that's when it becomes just something to do versus something to actually be. Um, gratitude doesn't need to be fancy. It doesn't need to be expensive. You don't have to have this fancy journal here, although it's beautiful. I wish I had that journal. I don't even know where it's from. I just pulled the picture. Um, but, you know, yeah, I would love to have a fancy, fancy journal. But is it going to help me feel more grateful? Probably not. So don't make it an elaborate process. Don't make it something that's not sustainable. Let it be simple. Let it be mostly spontaneous. 
um, we don't always feel like practicing gratitude, but but once you start trying to do that, it's going to become more spontaneous. Make it as fun and as free as you can, because that's going to be something that you're going to do over and over and over again. Some things that you can do to generate gratitude, maybe host a Friendsgiving or a potluck at work. Um, when I was in clinical back in the day, this I've been in clinical for over 10 years and recently have come out of clinical. Um, but the last time I was in clinical with groups consistently was right before COVID and I would have a Friendsgiving for my students. And so um, we would do a potluck and I would bring in a, like a lot of my favorite dishes and things. I would make my grandmother's dressing, homemade dressing recipe, and we would provide, you know, like the proteins and things for the potluck. And then students would bring in their favorite dish and we'd have it here at the school. And I would get some just really inexpensive decorations that I'd usually use at home for my kids. So it wasn't a huge you know, thing to do, but I would just, you know, reserve a room, a classroom, and we would have a potluck together, and I would invite all of my clinical students from that semester, and sometimes I had supervised eight, and sometimes I supervised close to a hundred, and it was so much fun. I mean, we had the best time doing things like that. I have a colleague that would host a barbecue every year in May for the students that she had taught. Um, you know, little things like that make a huge difference on the impact of the people that we work with. That would be the same as having a Friendsgiving with your with your colleagues. We do a lot of tailgates and things. Same concept, um, but make it about gratitude and showing appreciation. The College of Nursing for the first time this year is going to have a Friendsgiving this month. And so it's going to be something that we look forward to. And I think that's very important. Have things on your calendar in your life that you look forward to doing. That's going to spark some inspiration, some creativity, and then you're going to feel a little bit more like being in an attitude of gratitude if you have something to look forward to. Celebrate, give shout outs, text someone a thank you, give a hug, but always ask first. I am not a hugger. Um, I have a lot of pain from a lot of different surgeries I've had. And so um, I can do light hugs, but usually people are squeezer hugs. And so I always tell people, please ask before you touch somebody, uh, especially with hugs. But gentle hugs, like the little side hugs, like those are usually OK, but always ask. You might give a high five, smile, speak in the hallways, send a card, send a thank you note, show kindness and compassion. And you've got to show it to yourself before you can show it to others, though. Decorate your office space, you know, make it fun to be where you are. Uh, start a gratitude group. We have a gratitude group here at the College of Nursing that started a couple of years ago, and I'm on the team. And so one of my things is that I write notes. So every um, month I have a list of about 12 to 15 people and I write a note for them. So it might be something like this little card and I will write a little note on the back of it and then they can post it. And that's just like a little bit of an inspiration for them. And so that's what I'm doing this month. Um, find ways to make work and life fun. It, life is too short to not have fun and to not be intentional about it. Engage in a gratitude challenge like I showed you earlier. Um, but most importantly, just make it a part of your life and encourage yourself and encourage other people. It always helps to hear that you're doing great, especially because a lot of times we don't feel like we're doing great. So if someone recognizes that in us, then then that's think about how you feel when someone says something like that to you. Hey, you're doing great. I just want to say that, you know, thanks so much for blah, blah, blah. When's the last time you said that? When's the last time someone said that to you? Gratitude myths, you know, gratitude is just a naive form of positive thinking. That's something that's said a lot. Myth two is gratitude is not possible or even appropriate in the midst of adversity and suffering. And, you know, that is what I was talking about earlier. It's when we need it the most. When the world feels like it's falling apart and um, when life feels really hard, that is when we all need gratitude the most. Roadblocks to gratitude are things like stress and overwhelm and life circumstances, external factors, our mindset, or just our baseline personality. Some of us just don't have, um, you know, kind of the baseline personality that goes along with gratitude, but it doesn't mean we can't change it. And then our experiences, childhood and otherwise, but those first, you know, six years of life are very foundational in terms of how we see the world and how we view it. Um, something like mindset, which I'm going to give you a resource for this, is do we look at life with a scarcity mindset or with an abundance mindset? 
And um, for me, I was raised in a family and had challenges and have kind of the natural personality to look at things where they could be improved or where things could be better. That's a super great quality to have when you're a nurse or you're a teacher. But it's not always fun when you're human. And so always looking at the things that can be improved that can lend itself toward a scarcity mindset. And if you want to have a happy life, a healthy life, a more abundant life, you've got to have an abundance mindset and gratitude can help get you there. Eckhart Tolle is one of the geniuses of our time. He says, acknowledging the good that you already have in your life is the foundation for all abundance. Um, and it's like it's like into a gift. If you were to give a child a gift and, and maybe not a child, but maybe a friend, if you were to give an adult friend a gift and they never said thank you, they didn't show appreciation, they didn't send a thank you note, they didn't obviously, you know, seem happy or grateful to receive it. They just took it from you, sat it down. There was no acknowledgement, no joy, um, you know, nothing. Right. They just took it and, and just, just sat it down. Would you probably stay friends with them? Would you probably give them more gifts if that happened over and over and over and over again? Probably not. And so Eckhart Tolle and others like him, Louise Hayes, several other people who talk about mindset work, say, you know, that's what the life, the universe, whatever your orientation, you know, it could be God or, or a higher power for you. Um, but that's what it's like when we have all this good in our life and we don't show gratitude. We're getting these gifts every day, but we're not acknowledging and being grateful and showing appreciation for them. And then we wonder why they stop coming. It's because we don't show that gratitude. We don't complete that cycle. Um, and so there's another quote that talks about, you know, what if you only had tomorrow what you were thankful for today? Um, you know, what would what would your life look like? Did you show gratitude and say thanks today for all the things that you have? Um, you know, what if you you were to wake up tomorrow and only have the things that you showed gratefulness and thankfulness for? So control what you can control and don't give your power away. Um, you know, when we say that we can't do something because of circumstances or we say we can't do something because, you know, something is unfair or something is hard, we're giving our power and our autonomy away to life circumstances. And that never feels good. And that's never going to inspire gratefulness. So garden as a metaphor for life, you know, have a vision for your life. Prioritize and plan. You need good soil. You need good environment. You reap what you sow. You have to check your garden's conditions. And, and maybe it's that you have a physical health challenge or a financial challenge. It's helpful to address those things as proactively as you can so that you can actually truly feel grateful. Um, build a fence around your garden. You need those boundaries. Gardens need constant tending. Y'all know this. <laughs> Have patience and trust the process. Sometimes it looks like the plants are dead and then the next day they're green and the next week they're they're sprouting, you know, s signs of life. And so um, control what you can control, reap your harvest. And when you reap your harvest, share with others. So growing gratitude looks like preparing, planting seeds, so seeds of gratitude, right? Those are the things that we talked about when we were generating our list of gratitudes that we could do. Tending and nurturing those those seeds of gratitude, practicing it. This takes patience and perseverance. You got to keep showing up every day. Gratitude is a daily choice. It's a daily decision. And then paying it forward. So we're all just watering seeds. And like, what are we what are we watering? What are we growing? What are we feeding? Here's a gratitude game. Again, gratitude is not just reserved for Thanksgiving, but this is a fun one for Thanksgiving. Um, I think a lot of times we want to go around the table and say what we're grateful for. And sometimes people are, are feel a little uncomfortable with that. Um, so maybe say instead of what are you grateful for at the Thanksgiving table? Maybe you say, hey, name a place you're thankful for or name a food. Like what's your favorite food today or name a thing or, you know, something like that. Make it fun, because sometimes when we start this we may feel comfortable with the gratitude expressions at the dinner table, but others may not. And um, and that's not going to inspire gratitude for anybody or, or, or with, within anybody. So just make it more fun. And then maybe you can have another conversation later about what you're doing in terms of your gratitude practice. Gratitude changes everything. Gratitude absolutely changed my life. And, um, and I hope that you let it change yours. Because when you start to look for things that you're grateful for, it really does change the way that you look at the world and the way that you look at the things that you face. So here are some resources I want to share with you quickly. 
my favorite graphic about controlling what you can control. And y'all will have these slides, Miranda, if she hasn't already, she'll put them in the chat for you. But control what you can control. What matters and what you can control, that's where you should focus your time and attention and energy and effort because there's so much in life that you can't control that matters. And there's so much in life that you can control that really doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. Some recommended reading. So Choosing Gratitude, the little book of gratitude, which I have in love by Dr. Emmons, and then Choosing Gratitude, Your Journey to Joy. These are some good places to start. The little book of gratitude is actually a tiny little book of gratitude. It is a really good read and a great place to start. Some TED Talks on Mindset by Carol DeWick and then Stress, How to Make Stress Your Friend by Kelly McGonigal. They have a background in clinical psychology. And then Dr. Edmonds, this graphic here at the bottom, the Gratitude TED Talk, it's about eight minutes long and it's a really, really good start to you. If you want to do more work around gratitude, you can go there for more information. The affirmation I said earlier, I would share, I'm grateful. Gratitude is a prerequisite to happiness. When what I have now is enough, it becomes more than enough, and I open myself up to receive more. I'm grateful for the ups and downs. Everything has contributed to who I am today. I express gratitude for it all. And that's a beautiful affirmation. Some prompts that you could use this month to get started. There are tons of these online if you want to do one for the whole month. This is a great way to start gratitude journaling if you don't know where to start. And then just some good habits. Again, you can come back to these as more of a reference, some more health benefits, some more information about the benefits of gratitude. And this is by um, Amanda Jewell. Benefits of gratitude is the book. And then Laura Casey is an expert on productivity and she talks about growing slow. And grow what matters one step at a time. Little by little, your steps will add up. She used a lot of gardening analogies and metaphors in her work. And this is something that she wrote about peonies growing through the dirt. And meaning that the most beautiful of flowers, and peonies are my favorite flower, <laughs> peonies growing through the dirt. Uh, it's really about these beautiful flowers come out of some of the dirtiest soil um, and so do we. We grow through the dirt. So I love this. It talks about believing that anything is possible and that an intentional life is is possible. It's where we are. It's what we have to do. So I would love for y'all to read through that. I think it's a beautiful way to to really kind of wrap up our time together. And cultivating what matters is not magic. It is work. So this quote, it's not joy that makes us grateful. It is gratitude that makes us joyful. And that's so true. For so long, I thought I had to be happy and joyful first and then grateful. But that's not how life works. Gratitude and then joy and happiness follow. So speaking of following, we would love for you to follow us on social media. Here are our social media channels. And I will take your questions. I'm going to drag the chat over. But I would love your comments, your feedback, any questions that you have. I'm an open book, so anything you would like to share or add or ask, please do. And we also have a Q&A if you would like to send something anonymously. And I'm so sorry for my runny nose. I was freezing yesterday at work and I woke up with a runny nose and I think it's that plus the weather. Okay, let's see. Uh, Matt is asking about the challenge. And Marina says it's November 6th through the 20th. Taylor says thanks for the resources. Marina put the slides in the chat. Thank you. Chrissy, thank you. Glad you enjoyed it. Tiffany says I love the tip to add a way to be intentional to your calendar. Yes, because if you don't put it in your calendar, if you're like me, it will not get done. So... Um, put it on your sticky note, pop it in your calendar. Um, if you have a hard copy calendar or put it in your todays on your Outlook calendar, that'll help hold you accountable. Thank you. Any other questions, comments, feedback? Anybody want to put in the chat something that they're going to go and do as a gratitude practice or something they're grateful for? Anyone who doesn't mind sharing? Great. You love the idea of the gratitude jar. Yeah, that's a fun one. A good new tradition, maybe. 
We're at one o'clock, but as always, you're welcome to go. You've gotten your credit and so Miranda will take care of that on her end of things, but I'll stay here and make sure there's no other questions or comments. But thank y'all so much for being here. Oh, um, someone put in the Q&A, Abby, um, time. I don't have enough. Um, all of these grateful things sound awesome, but what would you recommend as the best, most easy to start to build relationships with coworkers? Yeah, I would say just five minutes matter. Um, so many times we don't feel like we have the time and, and we are always pressed for time, but you but we all have five minutes. And if we don't have five minutes, then that's when we need to kind of do a backwards reverse engineering and figure out, OK, where is my time going? Because if you don't have pockets of time, even five minutes, then then that's a different conversation. But I would say make it easy. So stop by and say hello to a coworker, ask about you know, things in their life that they're important to them. Um, I have a coworker who loves to ride bicycles. I know nothing about bicycling, but I always ask, hey, are you going riding soon? Like, what's your next big event? Y'all, I know nothing about it. And she knows I know nothing about it by the questions that I ask her, but she's always glad when I ask her about it. Um, and so that's something that you can think of. Um, so it doesn't have to be complicated. You don't have to give them a gift or anything like that. It could just be an authentic conversation. Or you could compliment them and say, oh, I really love that sweater. Or that color looks great on you because you don't want to compliment the sweater. Oh, that's a pretty sweater. Um, it probably is a pretty sweater, but you probably wouldn't have noticed it if it didn't look great on that person. Right. And so you can say, oh, I love that sweater. It's so pretty. That's a great color on you because then that makes it about them and not about the sweater. Um, or you can say, if that feels uncomfortable, you could say, I really enjoyed how you spoke up in our meeting the other day and expressed blah, blah, blah. I think we were all kind of feeling that. So I'm glad you shared that. I feel that way too. Those are some really simple ways. I mean, you can make it complicated for sure, um, but make it make it really, really simple. And then in terms of like for personal, I would say writing the things down. I felt really sick over the weekend. I was having some issues with my kidneys and having a lot of kidney stones. I was like, I have such a bad attitude and I'm teaching on gratitude this week. Like what is going on with me? And then I ended up having a kidney stone. And after I wasn't in physical pain, I didn't even register with me. I was like, oh, that was what was wrong. And so, but the minute that I realized I was having a, a not great attitude for me, I erased my whiteboard. I have a whiteboard in my bathroom that I share with my husband. And I usually put to-do list on there because it's just something that he and I see typically. I don't want my to-do list out in my entire house, you know. And so I erased the to-do list. I'm like, that's not getting done. I don't feel good. And I actually just started writing gratitudes. And I stood there while I was in pain Saturday night and not sleeping. I was like, okay, I'm going to fill up this little, you know, eight and a half by 11 whiteboard with as many gratitudes as I could. And and before I did that, I'm like, I'm in pain. I don't feel good. I have a bad attitude. I don't like when I have a bad attitude. Um, that there has been nothing to be grateful for today. And y'all, within about two or three minutes, I had written seven or eight things on the list that I was grateful for. And make sure you make it very specific. It's not just like, I'm grateful for my spouse. It's, I'm grateful that my spouse warmed my towel this morning. I'm grateful that my son made my coffee yesterday before work. Make it very, very specific because when you just do an umbrella, oh, I'm grateful for my work, I'm grateful for my, my family, I'm grateful for my friends, then that makes it harder for you to notice the really specific things that you're truly grateful for. Um, and it makes it feel more special, not just like I'm going through the checklist of like, oh, yes, I'm grateful for all these things. It makes you really feel grateful. I hope that helps. And this is not easy. Um, it's very simple, but it's not easy. <laughs> you like a swear jar better. <laughs> That's funny, Jared. Yeah, uh, you know, it's the little things in life. So maybe, I bet maybe people really appreciate your sense of humor. That's always needed. All right. Yeah, feel free to hop off if you need to. Thanks, Taylor. Marianne, thank you so much. I appreciate you saying that. That makes me feel good. Good to see you, Linda. Thank you. Well, y'all, thank you all so much for all of your interaction and all of the good conversation in the chat. If I can ever be of help to you, please reach out. I'm happy to do so. Um, and just go and do one thing. Don't make a whole list of things that you've got to do. 
Um, use this as a buffet, take what resonates, leave the rest, and just pick one thing a day, and that's where you get started. So I hope you all have a great rest of your week, and happy November, guys. Bye.